Guys, good evening. Thank you uh, very much for your time. Um, we're going to be talking about automated accessibility testing. Um, this is really um, just a nice guide for uh, testers by means of a way to actually uh, get get started with automated accessibility testing. Um, okay, so um, fundamentally, we're using uh, our Test Evolve product set with the AxCore integration uh, that we have here. Um, okay, so we'll probably run for about forty five minutes or so. Um, the agenda, obviously, you'll be aware of that. There's some key things we're going to be talking about. Um, so we'll start looking at uh, you know what accessibility actually means to us. All right, and, you know how we assess that how we start to measure uh, levels of compliance against that, okay? Uh, we're gonna be focusing on kind of web applications uh, today. Um, that leads us naturally into understanding a bit more about uh, these standards that we're probably starting to get familiar with, okay? So we'll look at that from a kind of a regional and an international uh, basis and what it actually means to be compliant uh, against these standards. Um, and then, of course, the main bit, you know, how we actually start to uh, create automated accessibility uh, checks. All right. So in this case, we're going to be working with a uh, Ruby uh, framework, a Ruby version of uh, Test Evolve today. Um, we also support uh, JavaScript and TypeScript uh, as well. Uh, and of course, some of the things you uh, you'll see today as well with certain libraries will be available to you in, you know, in other languages as well, in Java, for example. Um, and then the key thing, really, once we've actually started to run some accessibility uh, tests, starting to interpret the output. All right. So what does it actually mean? What do we see from these axe core audits? Um, and I think fundamentally, how, how do we apply some context to that? How do we start to um, communicate these to our uh, delivery team? You know, how do we um, categorize the severity of some of these issues that we find and how do we get them fixed ultimately? Um, so that when we then to think start to think about continuous um, automated accessibility testing, um, you know we're looking for those numbers of violations to drop, you know, with every cycle of testing uh, that we do. So we'll focus on how you know we think we can uh, record good quality accessibility bugs for our developers as well. Um, and then I think a very key thing to understand as well, um, especially for accessibility testing is what you can realistically expect to automate and what you can't. Um, okay, so I will state here and now that, uh, you know, with any kind of uh, automated accessibility testing, any kind of framework, any libraries, um, you know, it's well understood and accepted that at best, um, you can hope to um, automate the checking of around 50 to 60% maximum of all potential violations um, against your web application, all right? So it's really, really important to understand that um, this absolutely gets you on the right path and it gets you there quickly and it, it really helps you to kind of identify these low hanging fruit and get them resolved. Yeah. But you're still looking at 40, 50% potential manual effort uh, to, to do a real full accessibility sweep of your application as well. Um, okay, so that will always be the case. So let's just turn camera off for now and then we'll continue to dive in. Um, what I will say, um, I have Dylan uh, waiting in the wings. So um, we can take uh, questions along the way. Um, it's kind of by a uh, keyboard format, <laughs> if you like. So uh, by all means, open up the Q&A panel, um, type in any questions you have uh, around any aspect of what we're talking about or you know things that you think of along the way. Um, and Dylan's here waiting in the wings to uh, to get right back to you and to respond, um, hopefully, to your question. If we can't answer something straight away, we'll take it away. Uh, and we'll come back to you after the event. Um, this will be on our YouTube channel uh, afterwards. Um, all right, so let's jump in. So let's start to talk about what accessibility actually is. Um, all right, so we're talking about web applications uh, today, right? We need to understand how it's assessed, how it's measured, but fundamentally, all right, um, you know, statements from, from Tim Berners-Lee here, right? The actual, you know, the founder of the internet, if you like. The power of the web is in its universality, right? It's got to be accessible by absolutely everybody, um, you know, regardless of any potential impairments, disabilities, all right? Um, it has to work for everybody, okay? You know, irrespective of, of hardware, software, you know, uh, cognitive ability, um, we are looking to, to meet this goal of accessibility, um, all right, and making it accessible to people with a completely diverse range 
um, of abilities, right? There may be um, motor impairments, cognitive impairments, uh, okay, visual impairments, auditory impairments. Um, uh, from an application perspective, from an organization producing software, um, all right, this is just another perspective on a good quality application, all right? So if we're looking to develop high quality websites, you know, web tools, without excluding anybody from being able to use them you know we have to put accessibility up front and center we've got to take it seriously um okay um i think we all know you know we accept that accessibility in the us has been uh, you know been around for a very very long time um and i think certainly in the in maybe the last uh five to ten years uh in in, in the uk uh, in europe um, it's becoming uh, much more of an important aspect in terms of software development uh, as well. Okay, so this is fundamentally what we mean when we're talking about accessibility. Okay, making it available to everybody without, you know, without uh, uh, distinguishing you know, for particular impairments, disabilities. All right, critical aspiration for for building software. We start to talk about this idea of standards. Um, okay, so standards is the term we typically apply. Um, now, technically that's not, not true across the board. Okay, some of these are actually laws, right? So the things that, uh, the, the three that the majority of people will be aware of um, will be section 508, uh, the ADA uh, and the WCAG. Okay, so two of those are very US uh, centric, right? So section 508 and the ADA, okay? Um, and we'll look at the differences in, in more detail in a second. Um, on the other side of the fence, on the other side of the Atlantic, if you like, um, we have things specific to the UK, right? So we have the Equality Act of 2010. Um, and then across Europe, we have the European Accessibility Act as well. Um, and then a slightly different flavour of assessment, we have the uh, the ACT rules. So this is the Accessibility Conformance Testing Rules. Now, they all serve a bit of a different purpose, but they all work very well together. Um, what you find ultimately with most of these, um, that they essentially point back towards the WCAG guidelines as really the single source of truth. All right. This, this becomes our main reference point for, for each of these. Um, so let's let's take these in a bit more detail, each one. So Section 508. So this is actually a law. OK, so it's a federal law. Um, so it's really focused around. Uh, federal employees or members of the public um, wishing to access uh, government information, communications technology. OK, so very much uh, government centric uh, within the US, um, as opposed to the ADA, again, US centric. But this is actually a civil rights law as opposed to a federal law. Um, so the civil rights law, the ADA is is requiring businesses, state and local governments, nonprofits um, are making accommodations for the disabled public to access the same services, uh, same level of service as any able bodied patron, uh, of course. All right. Um, now let's talk about WCAG. So this is probably the one that people are most familiar with. Um, now, this is different, right? This is not a law. Um, to some degree, it's a standard, but really what it is, is a set of guidelines, best practice guidelines on how we can all build, develop and test accessible web content. Um, all right. So they do typically resent, um, represent a, a more stringent level of checking uh, than, than Section 508 or ADA. Um, and they are primarily focused uh, on uh, website, web app, HTML uh, accessibility. OK. Now, there are a number of versions for WCAG. So um, this is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. OK, so um, uh, version 2.0, OK, one of the more recent. Um, this came around in December 08. Um, it was superseded by 2.1 in June of 18. Um, so already this is kind of four, four to five years old. OK. Um, and 2.2 .2 is scheduled for uh, to be published in April. Uh, of this year okay and version three is already in draft format um now they are all backwards uh, compatible which we'll talk about in a second but if you uh, if you're interested in what's coming down the line in 2.2 .2 or version.3 you can go on the w3.org website and, and see um see what to expect um so that's just a little bit about the differences but ultimately you'll find that if you're uh, if you're in the us and maybe um uh, you know you're working in the government space and People are talking about Section 508. Ultimately, it's going to point back 
towards WCAG as, as its reference point. Um, all right. So we'll dig into that a bit more. So let's take section 508. We find it actually refers to um, WCAG 2.0 and the double A standard for conformance, right? So if you're not aware, um, WCAG and any version, uh, 2.0, 2.1, 2.2, version three, um, they have three levels of compliance, right? So we talk about a single, a double or a triple A uh, level of compliance. Um, I think by my observations, I think the majority of companies are striving for a double A uh, level of compliance. Triple A is, is, is very hard to meet, uh, I think. Um, so section 508 pointing towards version 2.0, right? So already, you know, that's that's an old standard. That's kind of uh, from 2008, I think we said. Um, the backwards compatibility comes into play in the fact that, well, if, you're, if someone's referencing version 2.0, actually just step it up to 2.1. Um, and if you measure yourself against that standard, that's going to, you know, that's exactly where you need to be to, to be technically compliant with level 2.0. Um, if we take ADA, um, that's focused on WCAG 2.1 and again, the double A uh, level for conformance. All right. Um, and then we start to consider the ideas of penalties. All right. So this is what we hear a lot about from from the US market, uh, you know, accessibility lawsuits uh, you know, for good reason, of course. Um, the kind of amounts you're talking about for a first time violation potentially against Section 508, you're looking for between 55 and 150,000 uh, US dollars for an infringement there. Um, and the ADA, not dissimilar, we're looking at 55 to 75,000 US dollars um, for, for violations that are recorded by the, uh, by the public. Um, and if you have repeat violations, if you don't deal with these things when they're raised, of course, that, that can escalate, okay? Um, as we say, the WCAG, this is not... Um, uh, something for which you are going to be penalized for non-compliance it is best practice recommendations you know and a, a globally accepted set of kind of universal best practices for accessible web content and hence why everything else tends to point towards it now um, I think the the kind of the last statement rings true there you know if you're in doubt about which of these standards you should be aspiring towards you know try and meet the latest iteration of WCAG currently 2.1 as we said 2.2 from April of this year, and AA would certainly be a good place to uh, to start. Okay, so a bit more focus on WCAG itself. Um, so it operates with these four key principles, all right? Um, under the hood, it's um, it's a large series of, of checkpoints and, and, and tests and criteria that need to be met. But any one of these will sit within one of these principles, okay? So we have the idea of, of um, things being perceivable, operable, understandable, and being robust, okay? So in uh, you know, more layman's terms, um, if we talk about perceivability, um, so the information and the user interface, the UI components must be presentable to users in ways that they can perceive, um, all right? So users must be able to perceive the information being presented. It can't be invisible to all of their senses. All right, so that's what we're talking about in terms of being perceivable. Um, operable is gonna focus on the ability to actually drive uh, the application to navigate the site, to use the UI, all right? The users must be able to operate the interface. All right, the UI specifically cannot require any kind of interaction uh, that a given user is unable to perform, all right? So that's uh, what we say when we talk about things being operable. Uh, and then we talk about being understandable, all right? So information and operation of the UI must be understandable, okay? So the content or the operation cannot be beyond any user's understanding. Um, all right, so these aren't always the easiest things to, to get your head around, but I think they start to introduce us to some of these concepts. Um, and then really we talk about the idea of future proofing, okay, or being robust. So content's got to be robust enough that it can be interpreted by a large number, potentially growing number as well of user agents and assistive uh, technologies okay so typically we're talking about screen readers and, and the like okay um, but as these technologies change as they evolve this content should remain accessible uh, to the users okay so that's what we mean when we're talking about being uh, robust all right so 
any of the rules um, that we assess a web application against, you know, there's a violation, it's ultimately going to sit underneath one of these pillars, these principles. Um, and I think we can start to understand for good reason why these are things of importance to all users. Um, right, let's just talk briefly about, you know, what we can and can't expect um, to automate. So really, I think most importantly on the things that are going to require manual um, intervention. Okay, so focusing on uh, the generating, the handling of uh, application errors. Okay, so when we record an automated test, we're not always going to see all of those errors and understand um, how accessible they are, how understandable, how perceivable they are. Um, so this is something typically we need to look at on a manual basis. Focus order is going to start to talk about how you navigate through, once you're on a page, how you actually navigate through parts of that page or, or large areas of functionality on that page. Um, you know, a user address form, uh, for example, you know, the cart within an e-commerce uh, website and the specific way in which we get from the top of that page to the bottom of that page, and then ultimately out to the next page. Um, there are limitations around what you can do with that from an automation uh, perspective. Um, and then keyboard support on uh, custom controls, um, and of course, screen reader testing, right? These are the typical areas in which you're gonna need to spend a bit more time um, and look at on a manual basis. And we did say, you know, this could still potentially account for between 40 and 50% of all potential violations uh, on your application as well. Um, things we definitely can uh, include within our automated checks. So we are absolutely looking at absolutely looking at hierarchy and, and relationships um, on on the application on you know on the DOM under the hood. Um, we're looking at you know ARIA roles, states, properties, validity, relationships, you know coding best practices that can all be programmatically uh, assessed. Um, color contrast, um, you know of course that's something you can check manually and visually, uh, of course, but actually we can do it programmatically as well. Um, and then making sure that we are applying uh, accessible naming um, to various parts of the application, the form controls and the links and the buttons, uh, et cetera. Um, so again, just to reiterate that point, you know, um, you know, when you're successful with your automated accessibility testing, you're going to do a lot of the heavy lifting, but you've still got a lot of manual stuff to do as well uh, for good reason. OK, all right, let's dive in. Let's actually start uh, to build some tests. OK, so I'm going to flip into um, uh, this is Test Evolve Flare. OK, so this is our, um, our cross platform studio application. OK, so um, you could use this if you're working on a Windows machine, a Mac, a Linux box. Um, that's going to be fine for you. So I'm going to open a Ruby project, um, as I say. Um, you could do this in, in JavaScript or, or TypeScript. That's absolutely fine. Now we work with uh, the idea of BDD uh, features and scenarios as well. Okay, so BDD, um, if you're not familiar with that, it's, it's uh, refers to behavior driven development. Okay, um, quite simply, it's a way of um, you know, developers, testers, business analysts, or product owners getting together um, to generate this kind of very, um, very readable, understandable, easy to digest language. Um, in order to um, elicit these requirements for, for functions on, on websites, web applications, mobile apps that are going to be built and ultimately are going to be tested and supported with an automated test. Um, so it's a, it's a very it's an intrinsic thing to the way, uh, you know, the way we work and, and, and the way it works in, in Test Evolve. Um, so what I see on the left here is a, a series of features. Within a feature, I have effectively scenarios or test cases, um, if you like. But right now, I'm going to use the um, the Flare uh, develop module to just quickly build out and record a brand new test. OK, so I can get up and running uh, very, very quickly. So I'm going to create a new feature. Um, the application under test today is going to be the BBC uh, website. OK, so we'll just call this feature. Um, Okay, I'm spelling okay. Yep, accessibility test of the BBC website. So I tick that, I create my feature. It's going to give me the option now to um, create a scenario. So we'll shorten this. We'll just say axe check BBC site. Okay, so I've created my uh, scenario. Um, we like to use nice, short, and concise given when then statements. Good practice BDD says you focus more on the 
the user journey itself and the outcome rather than the specifics of the UI. You know, so we don't we don't want to have steps in here that say, you know, when I click on such and such a button, when I click on a drop down list or I pick a value, we want to focus on the, you know, the end result of the user. So in this situation, I'm simply going to say, um, given I go to the BBC website, uh, I'm then going to add a then step. So a then is usually my outcome or my assertion, the things that I'm looking to achieve. Then I can execute multiple accessibility checks. All right, so I really only need two steps. Um, okay, so um, I, now I need to record my uh, my test itself. So I'm going to click here. I'm going to bin recording. Um, it's going to open a, a browser within for me. Um, all right, so the first thing I'm going to need to do, I'll uh, switch on my kind of record toggle. And then I'm just going to go to www.bbc.co.uk. All right, so the recorder is going to capture everything that I do. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is actually load this page. Um, OK. Uh, now, that's the only thing I need to do in my given step. Everything else is going to be represented in my then step. So in terms of uh, traversing the application and making these accessibility checks, I'm going to encompass all of that within my, uh, my then step. OK. Um, what the recorder will do, you know, if you've got, if you're familiar with um, Selenium uh, in particular, um, the recorder is going to allow you to kind of respect and maintain the integrity of what we call the page object model as well. So quite simply, that says for any, um, any page within the application uh, under test, in this case, the BBC website, I should have a representative page uh, within my automation project. Um, OK, so it allows me to kind of respect that and maintain that. So I'm on a uh, I'm on the home page now. OK, so if I already had that home page um, created in my automation project, I could select it from this list. Um, I'll say I'll a new page. OK, so we'll simply call this um, BBC home page. All right, it's going to name all my classes, my methods, my file name is going to do that for me. So I create that page. Um, and then I am going to implement my first accessibility check. So uh, I simply right click in the application. Now we've got two different types of checks we can make here. We've got page level checks and we've got element level checks. All right. So element level checks are typically more for functional tests. So if I'm looking to make sure that a button exists or is present, um, actually, what I want to do is run an audit check. So we've got two types of page checks, visual checks, audit checks. Um, visual checks, a completely different subject. Another webinar about you know, responsiveness, look and feel. Um, our audit checks allow us to assess an application either with Google Lighthouse or with AxCore, which is what we're focusing on today. So I simply add my audit check um, and I'm going to apply a label. All right. So really the purpose of the labels is for me to state where this check is being undertaken. OK. So I'm just going to add, um, in fact, let's make that BBC homepage. Let's type that again. There we go. Let's add that check. Good. And you can see on the left-hand side here, it's starting to capture these checks uh, as I move through. All right. So all I'm going to do now, I'm going to navigate through different pages of the website. So I'm going to click on the, uh, the news page. Um, right. It's a new page. It's going to prompt me to create a new page in my automation project, uh, which I will do. I'll we'll call this BBC News. Uh, and then I'm going to right click and I'm going to apply an audit check. And I'm just going to say BBC News page. All right. So simple as this traversing the application, adding these checks. And you'll see each one I do is adding it to the left hand side there. Um, OK. Uh, and then we'll move on to, we'll go through a few of these. We'll go into sport. So let's create a BBC sports page. Create page, and then I'm going to right click. I'm going to add my audit check. Cool, add check, and then we'll move on to weather and finally iPlayer. Um, be good. It's another new page here. Let's click new page. You can see weather. Let's add an audit check here. Good. And finally, we will uh, jump onto the iPlayer page. And we'll identify that. Create the page and then we'll add our audit check. OK, 
interesting. And really, this is no different. You know, if we were on the Amazon website or an e-commerce website, for example, um, you know, you're going to build up a flow like this that traverses the application. Um, you know, on, on Amazon or you know, an e-commerce site, you might you're going to come in on the home page. Maybe you um, maybe you search for a product. You end up on a uh, results listings page. Maybe you select a product. You're then going to be taken to the uh, the PDP or the product details page. Um, maybe you add that to cart at that stage. You then get to do a uh, an audit check against the cart itself, uh, and then you probably progress to check out something like that. Maybe it's then going to ask you to sign in if you're a guest user, and you can run an accessibility check there. So the process is is no different at all. Um, all right. So this journey is this is as far as I want to take this particular journey. So I stop my recording. Um, I'll come here, I can uh, close my browser. Um, I'm just going to flip to um, my ID now. So what Flare is doing, it's working continuously with your file system and uh, the project on your machine. Um, so just to show you um, what this is actually doing by way of generating um, Ruby code in this instance. Okay, so here was the, the feature and the scenario um, I built. If I step into that, I go to the lower level of the framework. Um, all right, we can um, see this is what we call the step definition layer. OK, so uh, the Ruby code that's been uh, recorded to actually load the website is this. We in, we instruct Test Evolve to open the browser and to go to this particular website. Um, and then you can see here when we talk about a single line of code to actually run an accessibility check is Test Evolve.audit and then the label. Uh, that we use. Uh, okay. Um, you saw me navigating through a variety of different pages and then making these checks as we go. Um, I was creating pages on the fly. So BBC homepage, BBC news, BBC sports page. So this is how we maintain the integrity to the page object model, uh, as we say. Okay. Now, just coming back here, one of the final things I can do when I've written a new test is just to add a tag, right? So we use tags to uh, isolate um, tests. We can either include and exclude single tag, uh, tags or combinations of tags for when we actually come to run these tests. So I'm just going to give this a tag of, um, let's call this new uh, new webinar, all right? And then I step out of the uh, development module. Uh, and what we now see is that my new test that I just recorded um, has been added here. I have the new webinar. OK, so let's just get underway and record uh, and uh, execute this test. So I use my uh, tag here just to isolate that test. Um, Flare's then going to ask you how you want to run that test. Right. So we are running this as an audit test now. What I said previously is that when it comes to audits, you have a choice. You've got, uh, you can either run this as a Google Lighthouse audit or an Axe Core audit. Okay, and of course, this is what we're focusing on today. Um, to actually make these checks, it's going to require me to use uh, a browser. Okay, so I could do that locally or via one of our uh, integrations to uh, kind of other leading third-party um, cross-browser, cross-device platforms. Um, I want to, I'm going to run this on desktop. I'm going to use Firefox. Um, if I really wanted to, I have a, a really low level of control in terms of the browser itself as well. So um, I'm going to keep this uh, maximized. But if I wanted to, I could resize that. I'm going to close the browser at the end of the test. Um, I'm only running a single test. So clearing cookies and, and using the same browser of, of no real consequence to me now. Um, but I do have the ability to kind of manage uh, Selenium based timeouts uh, here as well even you know, potentially specifying certain ver versions of, of Gecko driver in order to work with, with Firefox and, and Selenium. But that's all fine as it is, so I'll leave that for now. Um, and then I click Next. And the final thing I need to do is just specify the types of output or reporting uh, that I'm looking to see, OK? Um, so two things I'm interested in right now. We'll see a, a local test run report. Um, and then what I really want to do is actually push the results of this accessibility test uh, to our real-time uh, cloud dashboards as well. Okay, so uh, by selecting dashboard, it's going to allow me to do that. Um, the test itself, I'm going to give a label, which is Axe Webinars. Again, it's just to give the uh, the test a kind of a sense of purpose or meaning, so that we we then find that we identify that in Test Evolve Halo. Um, uh, we can find exactly what we need straight away. I've got my API key. I'm good to go. It's a local environment, single-threaded test. I don't need to change that. So I'm just going to run that now. First thing we see is the uh, the open console. Um, you'll see that this is going to uh, spin up Firefox. All right, it's going to load up the BBC website as we saw. Uh, it's going to run a check on this homepage. 
There'll be a momentary pause while it does that. It's then going to go to news. It's going to do the same thing. I think depending on the page, I think some of these may be quicker than others. Um, but here we go. So it's going to step through. And then it will do weather and iPlayer. And then we'll look at what it tells us. Cool. All right. And that's finished. Um, so the console tells us that the test was uh, successful. What I mean by that is that the test itself did its job and it completed. <laughs> All right. Because as we see, it's going to have returned a number of violations. So they themselves are, of course, not successful. But there's one scenario. Um, it consisted of two steps uh, in terms of doing its job and making the accessibility check uh, that worked as expected. Um, we immediately see a test run report here um, to that uh, effect. Um, but if I now flip over to um, our dashboard platform, um, I'm going to sign in to Test Evolve Halo. So this is where we push our real-time results. So I have just the one project. Um, and this data has come through uh, to here. So you saw me um, assign a label of Axe Webinar. All right. So I can immediately see... Uh, the results of my accessibility tests um, in our dashboarding platform. Now, I start to get a bit more kind of overall context here, right? So I ran five checks. I think we traversed across five different pages, a check on each page. In total, um, it's telling me I've got 18 violations, all right? One of those is critical, five of those are serious, 10 moderate and two minor. Um, what we also see is what we call the run properties of the test. So um, we can see that we ran this on the Firefox browser. Um, I'm working on a Mac uh, operating system. OK, so we see that um, this was run in a desktop uh, viewport and this was run locally as well, as opposed to a service like uh, browser stack. So that gives us some um, kind of basic fundamentals about, you know, what, what we're learning um, from, from this audit that we've just done. So I can click into this. Just going to zoom back out again. Um, and what we start to see now is this much lower level of detail. OK, so we'll talk about continuous accessibility testing um, uh, kind of towards the end. But as you start to run more of these scans, right, we're going to build up a history of these runs. And ultimately, you're going to start to see a run trend. So if you're doing this, you know, even once a week, once a day, you know, you're going to start to see that trend of, um, of whether your violations are hopefully should be going down, you know, as you raise bugs and you, uh, you know, developers fix these accessibility issues, you're looking for these run trends to start going down. Um, of course, uh, DQ systems, acts call themselves, there will always be updated rule sets that things are assessed against, that, uh, you know, measures of uh, that we're trying to comply with. Um, so you may see a time when things creep up, but ultimately you should be looking for a, a downward trajectory. Um, right, now what we start to see, let's dig into this a little bit more. So from an accessibility point of view, um, Test Evolved has deemed this to be a failure. Okay, now what that means is there have been one or more accessibility violations, right? And we've already seen that on the summary level on the card before. Um, what's nice now is that it starts to tell us the standards against which uh, these violations are being recorded. All right. So um, I think here we see um, that there are 11 particular things or instances that would be considered best practice. So not necessarily violations, but best practice things you'd probably want to think about. Um, we've got four violations against the Section 508 standard. Uh, and we've got seven specific issues against uh, the WCAG, and that's just the single A standard. Um, but actually, we don't have anything against either the double A or the triple A standard. Um, all right. So I think straight away you can see if your organization's, uh, you know, targeting double A, then at the moment you've not got anything that specifically contravenes that. Um, but if you were starting off, as probably most people will, on single A, then you've got seven things initially that you're going to need to uh, look at. And of course, you may end up building multiple flows through your website, your web application, you know, different pages um, to ultimately build up this kind of army of checks that you need to uh, undertake on a, on a continual basis. 
Um, okay, so to really get into the weeds then, so I can now um, select my failing scenario. All right, so this was my axe check BBC site. Um, I see that it was uh, five checks. I see the breakdown across severity there, one critical, five serious, etc. I can now click into this um, to get a much lower level of page by page detail. Um, all right. What's really nice about this kind of reporting is you still have full traceability, transparency to your, your source requirements or your BDD scenarios, right? So that permeates through everything that we do. Um, all right. So I can see my feature, the accessibility test of the BBC website. It's got my scenario name. Clearly, that's marked as a failure. Um, if I want to raise a bug from here directly to JIRA, uh, I can do that with our JIRA integration here. Um, but really, what I, I want to start understanding now is um, the page by page uh, violations. OK, so here are the five checks uh, that we made. Um, we can see that on the home page, actually, there were no critical, no serious. There's just one moderate. Um, let's let's pick on the weather page, uh, for example. All right, so I can now expand that. It's going to give me the breakdown and the detail of this one series, these three moderate issues that have been recorded specifically against that BBC weather uh, page. OK, so what we start to see here, right, we see the severities of the issues. OK, so I can target the, uh, you know, the serious potential issue there. Um, let's just zoom in a little bit there. This here is what we call a particular rule set. OK, so this is a moderate issue against the uh, the heading order rule set. Um, there are different types of rules, of course. Um, what we have here is a link out to the uh, DQ University. Um, and then we start to understand over here a little bit about the specific element um, or the UI component, if you like, in the DOM on the page against where this violation uh, has been recorded. Um, and then finally, um, we have some instructions on how these things can be uh, resolved. OK. So I'm just going to cut back to my slides uh, for one second. So we've built our test, we've run our test, we've now got some results. So here's just a kind of summary overview of, of what this information is going to mean to you. OK, so user impact, right? That's critical that we understand that. I think when we start to raise bugs with developers, I think we have to frame it in terms of what the impact is to the user. Um, you know, clearly you're going to want to pick off your critical and your serious issues, uh, first of all. Um, I think our job as testers here right now is to provide as much meaningful information to the development team as we possibly can, um, including some of the links to some of the documentation I'm going to show you in a second. Um, but ultimately, we've got to pick up on a particular element on a particular page, and, and something about that has to be fixed in order for this violation to go away the next time that we, we make that assessment. If you follow out one of these uh, links to the Axe Guide or the DQ University, uh, in fact, let's just do that now. Um, for a particular issue, you're going to see the lowest level of possible information you can. All right. So um, this is for an example I was looking at earlier. So we see uh, a particular type uh, of violation or description of this violation. Uh, OK, just underneath that, we have the specific rule ID. Um, we have reference to a rule set. So this is the most up to date uh, rule set from uh, from DQ systems that AxCore is using right now, 4.6. Um, very important to understand that these are kind of routinely updated and will bring more compliance checks into play. Um, so, you know, we always stay in line with that, making sure that people are assessing, you know, with the latest rule set and they're not seeing, uh, you know, false positives or, or vice versa. Um, and then we see uh, the severity, so critical in this particular example. And then I think we start to get the context of the standards that are being violated for that particular uh, issue. OK, so there'll be a real uh, level of detail around how that specific thing uh, needs to be fixed. Um, but also what I think is really nice is that you start to understand um, why this is actually a problem for a particular user that has a particular challenge. Now, if you only looked at one thing on this particular page, um, it would probably be this widget over here on the bottom right hand corner. This really tells you almost everything you need to know, um, I think, in order to raise this bug. So we can see that as a critical issue, this is absolutely going to affect um, you know, three categories of users, if you like. So blind, deaf, blind people and people with any kind of mobility issue. Um, and then we also see specific reference to an individual WCAG 2.1 level compliance check. OK, so you really have everything you know to dig into the weeds um, to start uh, you know, working with your developers to get these fixed. Um, 
if I look uh, specifically at the rule set itself, so if I look at what's incorporated within uh, 4.6, for example, I have a full list here um, of everything that would have been checked when I ran that automated test. OK, so this is just another source of, kind of reference material that you can uh, make use of. And if you follow out any of these ACT rule links, it's going to give you some um, uh, kind of advisory guidance, if you like, on, on what we call accessibility conformance testing all right so there's a series of rules in the community here to kind of further enhance your knowledge okay and now i think finally we have to um start understanding where this is specifically in the application all right so what we are seeing um within the halo report itself uh you know was particular aspects in the dom so if we were um you know if we wanted to look at a critical issue first of all um you can copy that information across um, in your browser, fire up the same page of your application, um, open up your dev tools from within the browser, um, click into the, uh, the elements tab and then run a search for that particular element. Um, and what you're going to see down here is that we find the particular element we're, uh, we're searching for. This was from a, an earlier violation, an earlier report, and actually it highlights it on the page for us as well. So we could see it's something in connection with this. Um, you know, search for a town, search for a city uh, input field within this page within the application. Um, all right, so I think we grab a screen, uh, a screenshot of that, and then we consider now about how we start to raise these as bugs um, with the development team. Okay, so let's just jump forward. So really, you're you're taking bits and pieces from the, all of this source material. Um, all right, and that's going to give you everything you know, everything you need to know. To then raise a, you know, a Jira bug in this instance, for example. So I think there's two things you can do here. Okay, what I've done is take a very generic kind of stock Jira ticket, if you like, uh, not a custom ticket by any means. And I've I've brought all of this information together, uh, the lowest level of information that I have, essentially within the description field. Um, of course, another option might be um, when you start to get into this, you might want to work with your Jira admins to build out a custom workflow for accessibility violations, right? So you can pick and choose the fields that you'd want to add to that Jira ticket type. Um, you know, of course, you could align the severities uh, with the WCAG severities uh, as opposed to your normal kind of Jira ticket workflow that you may already currently have. So you've got a couple of options there. But really, our job as testers is to get as much meaningful information into this ticket. And I think you can see that everything's really there. So I think we start with a summary that says this is an accessibility uh, violation. It's a critical. Um, it's on a specific page, the weather page of our application. Um, and here's the specific issue, right, of the description. It's that required ARIA attributes must always be provided. All right, so we talk about the weather page, the severity, the specific rule ID. We can talk about the standards, so it gives it some context to anyone that's going to work on this. Uh, they understand that this is in violation of the single A standard for WCAG 2.1, right? This is a must. We have to fix this. Um, we list the element itself, so our front end dev can go away and uh, you know, target that element uh, within the application. Um, and then we talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the types of users that are affected by this, again, to inject some context. Um, and quite simply, steps to reproduce. Yep, I just got to run an act audit on that particular page and I'm going to see the same issue. OK, as a tester um, with a um, kind of organizational aspiration for accessibility uh, compliance. Well, what's my expected result? Well, quite simply, I don't want to see any single A um, violations against the 2.1 standard on any page of our application. OK, um, and then I think where it comes really useful is to uh, take that um, why it matters section from the DQ University and you can use that to uh, populate your defect impact. I think uh, you can see at the bottom there we've uh, we've added the screenshot. So it gives it all the context, all of the information it needs to then be able to raise a real good quality accessibility bug. Uh, for your develop developers to uh, to take away and start working on. Um, okay. So I mentioned um, starting to think about continuous accessibility testing. So I think what, uh, firstly, you know, uh, for a company, an organization that's done no accessibility testing until now, until this point, just getting started is a good thing, right? But equally, we don't want it to become a, a one-off thing, um, you know, or even just a few times a year. There's no reason why this shouldn't be a continual kind of quality assurance exercise like everything else we do in a kind of agile way of working. 
Um, so let's get in the you know in the realms of thinking about continuous testing, including accessibility testing. Uh, all right. Every time we take a build of code um, to a new environment, you know whether it's a QA, a UAT environment, a performance environment, you know why shouldn't we run a, a subset of these accessibility tests against the application? Right, continual feedback, fastest feedback from from testers to developers, with all manner of different types of issues, functional issues, performance issues, accessibility issues, you know, security issues. This is just another quality perspective that we should put up front and center. Uh, and really give it the, the focus that it deserves. Now, there's really a couple of ways you can do this. Um, okay, what you've kind of seen me do today um, is really the idea of building uh, a dedicated automated test um, that is going to take a kind of a screen by screen approach. Okay, it's going to traverse the application in a particular way. Um, now, maybe you can do that with a single flow. You know, I'd be surprised if you couldn't do that with you know, between four and six workflows, you know, to maybe cover the entirety of your application. Um, okay, so that's one option. Uh, the second option, um, if, you know, if you've already, um, you've already had a productive testing team that have maybe, you know, you've got a, a set of 500 or a thousand functional regression tests that are already running um, in your kind of CI, CD pipeline. Um, actually, what you can do is inject that single line of code to run that audit check. Um, in specific tests that you know are traversing certain parts of the application, certain pages. Um, and then you could simply execute those tests as a subset by selecting them with the use of tags, like we saw earlier on. Um, now there are pros and cons to each. Now, what I will say, the first approach I kind of took here, um, ultimately, if you create a, a new and a dedicated suite of tests, you're probably gonna end up with a much smaller set of tests to do this because it's a smaller set of tests your specific accessibility testing pipeline is gonna run a lot quicker, right? It's gonna be faster. Um, I think a potential trade-off there, a potential downside is that your uh, your BDD scenarios start to look and feel, uh, you know, far too much about just purely accessibility testing rather than narrating uh, you kind of the functional coverage or the flow of your of your application, which is what we traditionally use BDD scenarios for. So that's one potential trade off there. Um, what I will say, you know, when you do build out dedicated accessibility tests, so where you're just as as we did uh, in this example, right? If I'm just keeping my test relatively simple, but just navigating from one screen to the next, and then actually running an accessibility test, if that's all it's doing. Um, there's far less risk of that test kind of failing functionally for another reason, and then essentially stopping my accessibility audit in its tracks. All right, so that's definitely one of the benefits of having isolated and dedicated accessibility tests. They'll be far simpler. They'll have one simple thing that they need to do, um, and there'll be less risk of them falling over for any other functional reason. So that's a, a definite benefit as far as I see it. Um, I think, you know, thinking about argument two, um, the obvious benefit to using tests that you already have is that quite simply, you already have them, right? You've already invested in your testing practice and, and the automating of these functional tests. Um, in and amongst those, let's say, 500 automate functional tests, you are absolutely going to already have covered certain pages of the application. Um, so you would simply go through, you know, you'd have to go through a review exercise to understand which tests are traversing certain pages. Um, you would then tag them, uh, as we say, but so you would have to do that upfront review. So that might be slightly time consuming. Um, the downside, I think the biggest downside is probably you are, you're going to be running more tests to effectively achieve the same type of accessibility auditing uh, end game or, you know, that goal. More tests, ultimately, that's then going to take uh, probably longer to run, right? It's gonna be slower. So if we we have this idea of fastest feedback uh, upfront in our minds, then we're probably, you know, probably the better idea is to have a dedicated set um, of accessibility tests that you build in the way that we've seen today and just have a single purpose. We have a dedicated CI CD pipeline with configuration that runs those tests and then outputs the results to um, to reporting platform like Halo, um, as we've seen today. Either way, both of these would require a separate CI pipeline, um, okay, because you are running these tests as audit tests, okay, not as uh, functional tests. Um, excellent. I think finally, I just wanted to close with um, what I find to be, a, you know, an absolutely excellent example um, of a compliance statement, all right, because ultimately, um, 
I think a statement of compliance is still really in the realms of, of self-certification. Um, okay, so as an organization, you can make a statement of compliance for your application to a certain standard, or certainly you can make your intentions clear. Uh, and I think this one here, so this is from the RNIB, okay, this is a, um, a UK organization, right, a registered charity. This is the Royal National Institute of Blind People. Um, you'll find this on their website, okay. Uh, and I think it covers so much ground, right? So it talks about um, bottom left there, you know, aspirations of uh, compliance, particular standards. So talking about the WCAG 2.1, uh, it also makes reference to the uh, Equality Act. This is the UK Equality Act of 2010 uh, and the EU initiative uh, that we mentioned earlier. OK, so it mentions all three of the standards uh, relevant to a UK organisation. Um, and then it tells you a little bit about how things are being tested, right? So it says here, kind of the, the second graphic there. So um, we try and work with a wide range of technologies. We can't, again, I think it's fair to say, we can't commit to testing every single browser version, every version of assist, uh, assistive technology, uh, and nor every operating system. So, uh, you know, I think full disclosure for, for, from these guys on how they do that testing or every mobile handset type. So I think that's a really important statement to have. Uh, in this kind of um, compliance statement, all right. Technology we're using, all right. So they've got some manual tools in here. So they're working with uh, with with JAWS, with MVDA. They're working with um, screen readers. Uh, they're employing. So this will be one of your um, manual checks, for example, at the bottom there. Um, keyboard and navigation only, right? So the ability to fully navigate the entire um, application or well, pure use of keyboard, no mouse control. Um, that's a specific uh, one of those checks, right? Magnification factors, you know, visual checks there. So a little bit about technology they're using and how they actually undertake uh, this testing. Um, and then I think uh, the other key things really, so uh, third party functionality and services, um, again, a clear statement. In some places on our site, we depend on third parties for certain functions, of course, standard. Um, and services we can't perform ourselves. Wherever possible, we work with these third parties. Um, and they even talk there about uh, achieving conformance with AA standard to 2.1. So actually working in partnership with your suppliers to share with your suppliers these aspirations of accessibility compliance. So I think that's a really important thing to note there. Um, and I think maybe just talk about a little bit about the kind of uh, the improvement. So things where they, they concede as an organization we're striving to do better in these particular areas. You know, we're not there yet. We will get there, but we're not there yet. So um, improvements they're looking to make. So uh, making these audits a more regular thing, right? So certainly when you look at this CI, this continuous integration, continuous development, continuous testing, including accessibility testing, as we've seen, you're going to go a long way to kind of realizing uh, that goal. OK, um, speaking with customers, incorporating their feedback. So always, always working with real users. And again, clearly, this is very much in the manual testing camp part of this. Um, but that's actually uh, absolutely critical to kind of holistic accessibility uh, success there. Um, and then as an organization, obviously, they're trying to keep up to date with the latest practices, best practices, the evolving standards. Uh, all right. So all of us, all, all of us, that's going to involve, um, you know, getting familiar with uh, the 2.2 version of the WCAG standard, which, as we said, is going to come out in uh, in April. Um, all right. And then I think finally, full disclosure on some of these issues that are outstanding. Right. So it's, it's the right thing to do to uh, publicize uh, information on things that could be a challenge to certain users so they've got issues with 400 percent magnification uh, affecting the visibility of certain content uh, but actually what they give you there which is nice is a, a resolution for that so it can be overcome by using uh, the arrow keys right so actually navigating the application that way um, and then there are issues with error validation which can affect error message announcement on page refresh so probably something that's affecting the uh, the screen reader there but perhaps most importantly, there is the ability on their site for any of their users to actually register an issue, actually to report something, to flag something up to them, um, knowing full well that they will get that prioritized. It'll be on their backlog and they'll look to fix that. Um, so I think aspirationally, you know, if you're looking to make a statement of compliance to a certain level of, of standards, uh, conformance to that, uh, accessibility compliance, this is a really nice way of starting to think about how to present that. Um, 
Good. All right. Um, I'm, I'm going to wrap up. But listen, thank you so much for your time. Um, I hope that we have covered off all of these topics that we said we would. So I think we've, you know, we've talked a lot about what accessibility actually is and what the standards are. You know, bearing in mind that some of these are standards and best practices. Some of these are actual laws, certainly in the US. You know, we talk about Section 508, the ADA. Uh, other things are best practice, but I think we could see how ultimately everything does point back to the WCAG as that single source of truth. And I think that will only become more and more pronounced as, as time goes on. Um, all right. And then we saw how quick and easy it can be to build out a brand new automated accessibility check um, in, in a tool like Test Evolve. There are many other tools, of course, um, you know, uh, in particular, we're working from a Ruby point of view, we're working with the Axe Core gem, you know, Ruby gem. Um, if we're doing this in JavaScript, we work with a certain node library, uh, for example. So these are all things that are uh, available to anyone putting together an automation uh, framework. Okay, and then we looked a lot about how to actually interpret these results. Now, what I will say, I don't think it's not necessarily a realistic expectation to say that um, all of our testers you know, within our organizations need to become accessibility experts, right? That will be a byproduct of this uh, ultimately. Um, but that's not the end goal here. The end goal is to record these issues quickly, accurately, and to get that to the development team to get them fixed, okay? You know, um, the happy offshoot of that is that your team will become more and more familiar. Um, you know, they will become more and more proactive with spotting these accessibility um, issues uh, and almost becoming kind of subject matter experts there. So, you know, that's a real, you know, a real good offshoot from that. Um, and then ultimately how we raise good quality bugs. As testers, we've got to raise the best quality bugs that we can. So a developer, a developer can pick that up and see immediately what the issue is. Um, we, you know, we, all of that description we took and we raised that within a JIRA ticket. We found a screenshot uh, to, there's there's nothing about that that shouldn't be immediately resolvable and i think that's the thing a lot of these accessibility issues are very very quick and simple to fix um which is why you know this idea of continual testing and making sure that, uh, that violation trajectory is always heading downwards um should be an aspiration of the testing team right this idea of continual accessibility testing like anything else that we do um and then we again just to really hit that point home um understanding accepting that whilst this is a, um, a great way of getting started, making significant progress, finding and fixing things quickly, with the best will in the world, with any framework, you're still only going to find a maximum of 50 to 60% of potential violations against these standards. The rest you're going to need to pick up manually. All right? And we strongly recommend um, that potentially you work uh, with an agency or a group of users. Um, potentially with that diverse range of, of, of impairments and some disabilities that can give you real world user feedback. Um, that's the most valuable kind of feedback uh, you're, you're ever going to see. Um, fantastic. Thank you. Um, Dylan, I'm just going to jump across to you. Did we have any particular questions that you've uh, already picked up or answered? Uh, no. All good. Fantastic. Um, Okay, well, look, we're right on the hour. So uh, once again, thank you uh, so much for your time. Um, if you do want to explore any of the, the ways of building and recording tests that you've seen today, um, by all means, come and talk to us. Um, all of our documentation is on GitHub. Uh, of course, we have a, we have a free version of the, the Test Evolve framework. Um, we have a 90-day evaluation. Um, or you, you, know, you want any more information about best practice or just getting started with automation, uh, please do reach out, search for Test Evolve on all of these social media channels, of course. Um, the aim will be for this to be back up on, on YouTube uh, in the next couple of days or so, so you can always revisit this. Um, but other than that, I'll oh, thank you very much for your time. Um, we will be doing a session like this probably on, on Lighthouse Auditing will be the next one we do. So keep an eye out for that in the next two to three weeks and it'll take a similar approach um, and we'll look at how we can diagnose um, Lighthouse opportunities and diagnostics for your, uh, for your web application. So thank you very much and uh, hope to see you soon. We'll wrap it up there. Cheers. <laughs>